I uh, appreciate you guys joining me on a Sunday evening for the uh, highly on update. Uh, I expect uh, the uh, information that's going to be rolled out. I hope I'm wrong. I hope uh, um, I'm wrong about this. I, I think the information that's going to be released is going to be a little spread out. Um, I think it may be a little bit lean going into what I consider to be uh, a little bit of a bridge session for Hylion. Uh, but uh, I was asked to provide this information from my perspective and no better place than Market Beat. Um, you may have to click in with an account to see the same information that I'm seeing here. Um, but if you are uh, unfamiliar with marketbeat.com, uh, uh, check it out. It's cool. I think it's the cleanest uh, example uh, to answer the question of, of where uh, flows are coming to in a specific uh, holding, uh, Hylion being the uh, uh, company of choice here. Uh, as we look at the inflows here, percentage of ownership, 27%. So uh, a lot less here than the uh, broad-based retail uh, community uh, of, of a lot of private owners. Now, obviously, these institutional ownerships can represent some pretty huge blocks of shares and uh, I would venture to guess that even though they may be a lesser of a percentage, uh, these guys rule the roost as far as being able to pick up the phone uh, and, and talk directly with any of the executive uh, management as well as the upper management alike. So um, it's important to, to monitor these. It's interesting enough to see where alliances are being placed right now with regard to Hylion uh, in its current disposition uh, being uh, still right at the uh, lows of its um, uh, of its uh, trading session over the last couple of years uh, since coming uh, to public markets, which is of interest to me. You know, I, again, I was asked to cover this and I didn't mind just jumping in here before we uh, enter into the topic of conversation for someday, which I do have a few items to talk about. You guys are going to be uh, satisfied with, um, you, you know, the current levels of, of attention that we get. We have one piece of news that I think is a sign of the times with regard to the Monet uh, transition from the reservation order book to the order book. Uh, I think that was good. I think that was really good. Uh, I think Hylian needs to do more of that. And I believe that they will. There's just no doubt about it. I think these companies and Monet is not a Innovation Council member. So uh, really telling there, but we'll get to the agenda here after we scroll down here and see where a lot of the inflows are coming in. I, I just think the information is pretty straightforward. Um, 91 uh, number of institutional buyers over the last 12 months, uh, 91 total. Uh, the total inflows uh, capped out at about 238 million. Uh, number of institutional sellers last 12 months was 41. Um, now, the ratio between the inflows and the total of outflows, I would um, caution you to uh, bear in mind to the 34.2, which is about seven and a quarter uh, million, about eight X, perhaps maybe seven and a quarter X, uh, the number of outflows in Hylion Holdings than the number of inflows. So, um, even though 41 is pretty darn close to half of the number of outflows, um, I, I think these are probably positional uh, cells than anything, as opposed to panic cells. If we started to see this number here creep up to something that would give this uh, inflow number a run for their money, I would, I would raise cause for concern. But these are big, big institutions that are holding these um, net inflows into uh, the company over the last 12 months, which is interesting enough because you know, while the retail community has just been in arms, it's been a tough, tough stock down. I'm not going to sugarcoat this bitch. Uh, it's been a very, very tough. Uh, and it's been tough as of the late last week, really, to see companies like Nikola announce that they're um, uh, going to production uh, and, and providing no granularity around that, like who's going to buy their product. Uh, but they come out and they make something up like they're coming to production, which I believe that they are. Uh, I just don't think there's been enough pulse in the marketplace to know how acceptive their product is going to be. Uh, I don't know if their product is going to um, be well received on the onset and then reach market saturation uh, because of the unique nature in which they've approached integrating uh, if they are, in fact, able to integrate into the class eight space. I uh, I, I cannot get behind Nikola. I did sell my long calls in Nikola as well as Heisen, uh, both for a nice profit, but I don't have conviction on either one of those two companies. Um, Hyzon, I could make a little bit more of a bull case than Nikola, but Nikola's got a lot to prove here. 
They really do. I think their financial position is good. Uh, I think it could have the potential to accelerate south really, really quick uh, with regard to the uh, margins, which I can only speculate are going to be challenged going forward uh, as they're looking to take the truck from inception uh, to full production on their own. And, and, you know, I wish them all the best for the space. I really do. I just I have a hard time believing that big uh, uh, fleets are going to be uh, falling all over themselves to rush into uh, a new technology, just like all three of them. I believe there's going to be some hesitation uh, to to validate these products before they make big commitments uh, to the product. But the stock itself here, uh, 24 million bought uh, as opposed to 10 million sold uh, in Q4 uh, just uh, last year. Uh, so we don't have the new statistics for last year with regard to the stock action, but in, 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 interesting enough, uh, 24 million in the quarter, uh, 10 million sold. So just less than half uh, of the total outflows. So, you know, during what I consider to be the dark period for the stock, um, you know, there, there's no doubt about that, that, you know, if there was going to be an improvement in those numbers, then that's where it would be at. But here's the uh, reported uh, holdings here, and this is one month old, uh, so fairly new information here declaring to you guys. These positions range uh, from, you know, uh, anywhere from smaller institution uh, hedge fund companies that, that own these all the way up to the larger uh, hedge funds and larger institutions that own these. But uh, um, the, top, the top ones here, Westward Holdings, uh, with 11,000 shares, BlackRock with uh, 8,800,000, uh, Wells Fargo taking a, a reduction in the quarter anyway, um, down to 85 million shares in Goldman Sachs. I always name them within the top five, uh, Terrasso Investments, uh, Deutsche Bank, California State Teachers Retirement System, Parametric Portfolio Associates, uh, Pansera Capital, and finally Metropolitan Life. So um, interesting enough here, you know, only three out of these, what, two, four, six, eight, ten. Okay. An NA on the top line, but uh, three out of the nine here declared were uh, net outflows uh, in the quarter. Uh, and then the remaining uh, six were net inflows. Uh, nice big increase here from Terrasso. Looks like they're building a nice position, just a little over a million dollar position here. And you know, BlackRock still being the dominant here. I believe they, yeah, here, five, just over 5% of the company is what they own. So um, you guys can check that out at Market Beat. It's kind of cool to check that stuff out, but um, I really appreciate you joining me for the Hylion update. I, I do think as far as the stock goes, um, it, it has been tough this week watching uh, Nikola really get favor in the market. Uh, I, I don't have an answer for you. I, I don't. Um, it's doubly difficult to, I pick up on a lot of things. Um, I have my inner circles and my inner inner circles uh, in social media. Um, and, you know, there's some people within my inner inner circle, the ones that are uh, tried and true shareholders with me in this highly on uh, evolution and this highly on journey. Um, I, they get it. They see the same things as me. And I, I, I see some, um, uh, you know, some um, not necessarily pop shots. Uh, because I think they're inadvertent, but it, it's amazing to me how I sit back and it, it's always easy to lump Hylion in with the SPAC community. It's always interesting to lump Hylion in with those companies that are pre-revenue. <laughs> um, and, and I think if you're following the story closely, I, I think you can find here and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated here at whether or not Hylion was brought to public markets to um, really see their vision forward, and they probably should have had more of the vision um, in line with um, before coming to public markets. In other words, you know, had they been put through the, the scrutiny of the financial rigor, this company wouldn't have been eligible to come to public markets via IPO, right? And they've been provided a long leash. They really have, in all, in all fairness. And I, I know there's highly on bulls out there that are just bullish all the way. And um, I, I, I really try to walk the line here. And when there's something frustrating about the company or there's something positive about the company, I try to share that uh, with the good of the uh, conversation. Uh, for you guys who are new to my message and understanding my small niche in this small, insignificant corner of social media, um, I am a shareholder in Highland Holdings. 
Um, I have been all the way through. Uh, I've taken two sets of liquidations on blocks of shares, and they have been significant blocks of share in highly on holdings uh, in my um, evolution of being a shareholder with the company. Uh, the first one was, was really a, a falling knife uh, type of perspective where uh, it was in its free fall from the 50s all the way down. I think I finally took my liquidation uh, at $26, and that was actually a total liquidation. Uh, with the uh, expectation of buying into the company uh, at a later date. I, I didn't care if it would have turned back north again. Uh, I would have entered into the stock at a higher price, but I just didn't see it coming. I really didn't. I, um, uh, I didn't see it falling all the way to $3.33 a share either. Um, but there you go for the stock market for you to um, really dole out um, uh, some, some, some real some real learnings uh, on this specific one. I think some of it is justified, not all of it. Uh, I, I think these companies that I follow, like uh, Hyzon specifically, uh, and Nikola uh, primarily, uh, with the favor that they get in the market, I, I don't get it. I, I don't understand why they're provided the nod. Uh, I don't understand why they're not put under uh, as much scrutiny as Hylion. I'm not really sure why the, the real niche of Hylion isn't explained. It doesn't need to be, uh, it doesn't need to be bolstered, uh, but it does need to be explained in a way that you know, investors can understand that just because Nikola is the hydrogen fuel cell play, the, the reality of the situation is that the, the, the transferability of hydrogen is, is a problem in and of itself. Um, the, the very nature of you know, asking uh, fleets that have been dominated by diesel in, over the last 100 years plus um, in an industry that has uh, uh, garnered massive reliability from the diesel industry and to transition into a hydrogen fuel cell era when there is no fueling infrastructure available to those specific fleets, um, I, I always step back and I'm always scratching my head here whether or not I'm missing it. I know I'm not. Uh, I know I'm not. The, the stock market can, can prove you wrong, even though you're right. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Um, that, that's why I say all the time, these people who think that they can just do their due diligence, for example, uh, and make your um, investments based on that due diligence and think that that's going to be the end all be all of your success in the stock market. You haven't been doing this very long. Um, it, it's it's going to take um, uh, an undetermined amount of time to realize the vision of Hylion. I think over time, uh, Hylion will absolutely prove its worth. Uh, right now in the short term, we're just getting kicked in the nuts every day. It's just that simple. I mean, we're, we're really getting kicked in the face here. We're getting kicked in the teeth. You know, the, the, the company comes out with some good news. Monet uh, uh, transitions uh, part of the reservation order book over to uh, uh, orders uh, with deposits. I found that to be a very, uh, very bullish tell uh, for Hylion. But I, I, I think what's going to be accepted in the eyes of the market is going to be uh, is going to be necessary to overshadow the um, hated nature of this stock. Now, the people who own the stock and the company, like myself, I feel the same way. There's nothing to love about the stock. Um, the stock has been a horrible, horrible uh, ride. You could have just as easily invested in the S&P the last couple of years and done, done quite well. You would have made a lot of money instead of lose a lot of money. Let, let's be real and tell it real. OK, the, the stock here at four dollars and thirty seven cents. And there's some schools of thought out there that would suggest even highly on overvalued at these uh, bargain basement prices. As far as I'm concerned, there is some merit to that argument. There is uh, trading to, you know, a, a two hundred and fifty million dollar premium to the cash on the books with anemic sales of two hundred thousand dollars right now on the books with an anticipated uh, burn rate of around $135 million per year in the company with a projected revenue in 2023 of 2 to $3 million. You think, boy, with those statistics, what would anybody be doing taking a stab at this company right here? The, the thing about it is this company is going to interact with the market, and it's certainly going to interact with retail investors, and it's going to 
siphon out anybody who is not fit to understand the unique nature of how this company came to public markets, how it entered into public markets and was provided that long leash, for a lack of better terms that I talk about, to, to really not only incur supply chain issues, yes, but to, to, to really use market time to validate a product that even I interpreted to be a, a lot longer along the line uh, than, than they were. Um, you know, I, it's, it's somewhat of a sleight of hand, to be honest with you. Um, I, I thought that there was going to be a, a lot more uh, acceptance of the hybrid product. It's looking like the hybrid product is probably dead on arrival. Uh, I think if they can pull two to three million revenue, I, I, I don't see how they're going to do it. But if they can do it, I'll consider that a win and chalk any other hybrid sales up from now into the future beyond 2022 uh, as being a bonus, really. Uh, but the Hypertruck ERX is the one trick pony. Um, and you could argue that that's two products in one, okay, with the ability to uh, go to a fuel agnostic type of application, remain with RNG, CNG for those fleets that are interested in the freedom and flexibility to go between. And then when hydrogen fuel cell becomes available again, which I have a 10 plus year horizon on it, yeah, then they can, you know, fill the, use the uh, uh, hydrogen fuel cell uh, to uh, fuel the generator, to run the hybrid, uh, hyper truck ERX. I don't see that happening for a long, long time. So we're, we're talking about a one trick pony. It is the company uh, going to be able to deliver in such volumes to, uh, to, to, to make this one trick pony a reality for fleets, put this in the hands of the fleets and have them perform uh, in, in the way that I would pose to Thomas Healy if he was uh, uh, wise enough to come on to the Independent Investor Channel and, and take an interview with me. I think he should. I, I think it's a big mistake not doing it. Uh, I think there's hundreds of people who tune into me, if not thousands, uh, who appreciate my neutral application. Uh, everybody's rooting for the company. There's no doubt about it. But the stock's been atrocious. 100 people, 100% 100 of people who have invested in this company have lost money. Um, and that, that, that is put on the CEO. And um, I wouldn't be so apologetic in my interview. Uh, I would be fair. Uh, I would be succinct. Uh, and I'm going to go over some of the things that I would talk to about with Thomas Ely, uh, nary of which I have heard on any interview on social media, none. And I'm, I'm saving these a little bit. So <laughs> if you're a patron to the message now and you want to steal these and you're able to garner an interview, I'll sit like a student and watch the interview. But um, you know, the, these are the things that actually... Are, are things that are on my mind with regard to the highly on opportunity and how we are going to navigate the next couple years of bridge years. Because I think if, if, if by nature of Sherry Baker's projection here on the financials, you know, a two to $3 million uh, uh, revenue increase with uh, uh, still no bottom line earnings, uh, that that's is it going to be enough to bridge us? I, I there's not a whole lot further we need to go until we get to zero in the stock. I mean, and we're talking about a you know a, a, an insignificant pink sheet at, at this point. I mean, we we don't have a long way to go right now. I think. I mean, we, we think that things can't get bad right now. Again, there's schools of thought that would suggest that Hylion is significantly overvalued here with their inability to garner any type of revenue um, that, that is, um, that is uh, justif justifiable of a company that's uh, uh, three, three, quarter, uh, three quarter billion, uh, excuse me, uh, $750 million, right? So, you know, different schools of thought on it. I think we really are in kind of no man's land with the stock. Uh, it's anybody's guess. It's not a position of convenience. It's not a con con, uh, convenient position to be in at all as a stock owner. Certainly not a position of strength at all. Okay. Now you might think, well, what's the downer message in the in the in the the deal, Ryan? And I I think there's a lot of people who like when I come on and they I cheerlead and I jump up and down. I'm fine. I had a great day today. Actually, it's very busy. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like every day. Um, but owning this company for two years, I'm also a human being. And as I continue to do due diligence and I continue to not get hung up on the fact that it is a far cry 
now $2 a share away from Heisen and all of $6 a share away from Nikola, which seems insurmountable at this point. It would take a double and a half at these level levels. It would take a doubling and a half, 150% increase from here for Hylion to even draw near to Nikola and their market cap at what, four billion, four and a half billion, I believe. Uh, I, I don't get it. So to, so to continue to hear it from my inner circles, not the inner inner circles, but the inner circles about those people who look at an investor like myself who has put himself out there, right? Made an investment in a, in a company that I'm just as convicted on now as I was then. It's that simple. Would I want to rehash the last couple of years and go through um, some of the anguish uh, of owning the stock? No, I haven't. I believe that that's work that's put in the bank that will pay dividends down the line. But it's easy to take pop, pop shots on somebody that's that's down. The irony in the whole thing is I never do that. Um, I never even think about doing that. Never. I don't. I don't, for the sake of convenience, um, identify the independent investor channel with investing in a company like this. And I, I would have never done that um, because I have the hindsight in the market to understand that you just don't do that. It's a pre-revenue company. Therefore, what's a value investor like Ryan doing, getting involved in a company like this? You know, How dare he see something in the market that BlackRock sees the same as me um, insofar as taking a position? BlackRock's not up in their position. Um, you know, Wells Fargo, they're not up in their position. Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs has been a down, downgrader of the company this entire time with the likes of, you know, Stephen Fisher, uh, as well as some of the other analysts who can't get their analysts downgrade out quick enough uh, after every single quarter's reports. Honestly, I would just block them from the calls. Now, I know they can't do that because in a politically correct world, um, that, that would just be uncivilized, right? I can't stand these fruit kikes. Uh, Stephen Fisher can't uh, say two words without muttering and sputtering and spitting all over himself to try to spit out what he has to say. But I'm certain that if he puts himself and his nose in a corner, he can sit at his computer and come up with some reason as to why they need to downgrade the stock even further, while all the while the very parent company that they represent holds a pretty uh, lofty position in the company. So your guess is as good as mine as far as my soliloquy on this no man's land with the stock. Certainly love to hear your comments and 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 um, and feedback on where I've got it wrong, where I've got it right. Love to hear your feedback as usual. I enjoy reading the comments section. This is really my only outreach once per week now. I'm taking obviously kind of a hiatus on making frequent videos through YouTube. Um, this is the topic that I want to cover right now. Uh, and this is what I'm going to continue to do. This is what I want to do. This is what feels right. Um, I, I, I'm one of those funny guys, you know, sometimes leading is um, really lonely. And, uh, you know, I, I hear the pop shots over my shoulder. I do. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting, too, of everything that I've ever given through the channel, um, that there can't be a little bit of just uh, perspective and take a step back and try to ask yourself, man, we've known Ryan a long, long time. What's he trying to do here? Why is he trying to do it? Does it have a chance of working out? Because the pop shots are such to mean that in the short term, it's a stupid move, right? Um, what am I doing? Investing in a pre-revenue company, which it's not anymore. Um, they are drawing on revenue and I don't think we'll ever look back uh, on, on the days of being a pre-revenue company. I don't. But I think in all fairness, you know, my sincerity comes through in the message and sit back and try to understand what I'm trying to do in representing a retail community that I think um, gets gets the, the, the tough end of the stick every now and then, or most of the time. Uh, and I think if there is some stock manipulation going on here, uh, the, the stock is, um, you know, a, a absolutely a target for manipulation. It has been from since day one. It's been something that the company has not been able to overcome. Uh, they've delivered a lot of good information up to this point. But, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see if it does, is it, if, it, if it's ever able to break through. I think the problem with it is, is that the glaring fact that highly on using public markets as a proving ground uh, to bring their, their product to market, uh, solidify it, 
uh, justify it, sell it, integrate it, and confirm it all at the same time has really proven up to this point to be too much for Halion. It has. It's been too much. And we're looking at another 24 months to tack onto it with no real clarity on what after those 24 months is going to look like. Again, if you have speculation, and I know Rick will probably comment to me and say, hey, all is good, Ryan. You know, we're going to have a, a thousand orders solidified uh, on the order book for 2024 all as well. Uh, if that happens, great. You know, that's 20% of the break even 5,000 that we're, uh, that we're, that we're looking at. So does it push it out to 2025 with the hopes of what boosting it up to 2,500 at that point, which is 50% of the anticipated build out, right? Um, is there an opportunity for some level of fleet saturation once they get these initial units put into play? I mean, you've got seven years, the profit and the margins are realized up front. But once they are put into play, new orders need to backfill the, the, the following year's orders uh, to make sure that that order book is solidified. And it, it seems like a long way away to get to that 5,000 orders. Now, I'm not saying the stock is going to remain at $4.33 if we get into 2024 build slots solidified through, let's say, Peter Built or whatever. I find it highly speculative on our part to say that out of the 40,000 units that are turned off of the line, that Peter built is all of a, all of a sudden going to yield to Hylion and say, yeah, sure, you can have a thousand of those opportunities for our, those customers that we represent to segue into the Hypertruck ERX. I, I, I don't know. I'm pretty monotone with my application there. I wish I could just tell you, yeah, absolutely. They're going to own it all. They're going to need multiple OEMs. And I, I thought being apologetic to Thomas Healy during the Jason J-Mac interview uh, was the wrong approach. I, I thought, you know, just, just apologizing for it and saying, well, you just you addressed this on the earnings call. Um, I, I didn't think that that was the press. And Thomas Healy's a, a big boy, okay? He's a public CEO in a publicly traded company. If he was a private company, wouldn't be a problem, Right. But there's no need to be apologetic with regard to your plans to, yes, take the hyper truck and focus it on the one OEM that you have. But, but what is your sales team? What is your data and analytics? What, what is your customer relations management software and speculative uh, calculations tell you with regard to your break even units? Do we have it wrong in the retail community? Is it 3,750 units? I don't know. You know, there's there's no real uh, uh, transparency with regard to those break evens. It's always just like, hey, trust us, we'll be there for you. Oh, but by the way, not until the end of 2024 or the end of 2023, which basically buys them 24 months from now. Uh, we've been in public markets for for 24 months. Uh, we've got another 24 months to go. You tack a year on top of that, and they've built built against that order book of build slots by X number, and that's highly on in a nutshell. And and I, and I tell you what, guys, I'm I'm super hungry for information. I know there's people now that are um, really really stoked at the stability of the stock price, but uh, the stock and the company both are very vulnerable as far as I'm concerned. Um, I. I don't understand this. I anticipated that information again would go lean uh, and sparse on the line. That's so why I don't understand, man. If, if Thomas Healy can't find uh, 30 minutes out of his time to come on my channel uh, and share the story from his perspective with myself being the one that's, that's answer, asking the questions of Mr. Healy, um, I, I, I question the acknowledgement to the retail community that owns 34% of this company, excuse me, 37%. 37% of this company is owned by public markets, the very markets that are down 100% in this company at this particular juncture. And that give back is too much uh, on behalf of Thomas Healy and his team to recommend coming on to a social media channel like myself, who is represented highly on holdings from the beginning. I, I, I don't know. I, I'll leave that on the shelf. I'll leave it as a delta. Uh, it's one of those things that has, um, it's always bothered me a little bit. Uh, it's one of the reasons why just in spite of the system, I come on once a week and I share my thoughts and people say, hey, you know, my time is too valuable. You got to do an eight minute video of highly on. I can't do that. I won't do it. Uh, it because if this does turn the corner 
And fleets are interested in this to the, the, the point that we cannot forecast. And the last 24 months have proved to us just that. I didn't know Monet even existed. I didn't know Return It even existed. I didn't know some of these fleets, you know, where's Idealis? Hylion has put themselves in bed with a lot of companies out there. There's no doubt about it. Um, I, I can't name one from Nicola. Now I don't, I don't cover Nicola in all fairness, but I, am I missing this? Are there customers out there that have actually put the Nicola uh, product in play and actually have turned back positive uh, feedback uh, for their interactions with the company? And I, I'm just not seeing it. That's the further along of Hylion that I see. And, and, and the recessed stock price to boot is just kind of a double whammy. I, I, don't, I don't get it. And to be honest with you guys, um, if there were good news out next week, Anheuser-Busch or Budweiser comes out and puts in an order of, you know, 5,000, 4,000, 2,500 Hypertruck ERXs binding at the end of 2024 and 250 of those solidified build slots with Peterbilt. I, I have zero confidence that the stock would even move on the news. Um, I, I think the stock would move and then it would go right back down again. Why? Because the, in, in, the retail community has been so pulverized, even investors like myself that know conviction is the only way on a company like this, we've been pulverized so bad that any, any positive move that's, or any positive news that's been released uh, ha has been taken and uh, fallen on deaf ears uh, as far as the stock goes. Uh, the company benefits for it. Uh, the, the company is progressing. The company is making notable strides, not in, not insignificant strides, and not and not incredible strides, but they're making notable strides. There's nothing here to look at and say, "Wow, I've got to liquidate my position." Hylion is looking like that they're veering uh, and exiting stage right. It's not like that. They're 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 solidifying their order books. They're transitioning from reservations to orders with deposits. All these are positive moves. What more does the stock market want? And for those many, many companies that I cover out there that I even invest in that, that don't have half of the prospects that Hylion has, uh, I, I think we're just approaching a specific catalyst that nobody, not even myself, can put their thumb on. Uh, but us investors that are bullish on the company know that it's inevitable at some point down the line that over the course of this bridging, we will have a chance to encounter that catalyst uh, and, and really have something special on our hands. Then sentimental, of course, change, even with my tone and tenor, you know, I'll come on here and be like, okay, you know, at least the company is trading at a reasonable valuation. There's no reason why this company shouldn't be trading at one, one and a quarter billion. There's no, no reason in my mind, one, one and a half bill. You know, it's going to take the solidification of the order book because really, as far as the market goes, it's discredited all of its existing order book up until now, it's as if they're saying that they're not going to turn back any revenue from those, or maybe they are, but it's not going to uh, uh, result in any type of follow-on orders uh, with, with regard to that order book and solidification. But uh, that's what it really comes down to. Uh, what, what is the prospects for cash flow generation with this company? And, um, you know, I, I was surprised at the 200,000, but, you know, for a $750 billion company, $750 million market cap right now with such anemic uh, revenues on the top end, that they, they do have to do better. They know it. And I believe that they will. And I believe that the stock price will be drug along at some point, kicking and screaming, because um, there's got to be investors out there a lot less tough than me that are pissed off. I mean, just pissed off. And I'm not saying that I don't have a specific degree of pissed offedness some somewhere deep inside of me. And, you know, I, I Thomas Healy seems to be taking the high road here, but man, what a, what an interesting kind of kick in the teeth as well to, to, to really bring your solution to public markets only to have it fall on such deaf ears. It, it's really no man's land for the stock right now. Um, I think it's unfortunate. I, I think there's companies that really are getting favor. Uh, and right now, let's just call it for what it is. Highly on holdings is out of favor, uh, even though after the last month or so, the stock has found its footing. 
I think uh, as shaky a ground as I consider it to be, uh, I would consider this. Now, the 4% dip on Friday, I didn't even understand. There was no news. And the stock just dips 4% for no reason. I, I don't understand it. Uh, all the while, nickel, I think, ran up 40% for the week. I, I, don't, um, I don't understand it at all. Uh, it's uh, pretty frustrating, but we'll continue to remain in the pocket and continue to fight the battle anyway. My questions for Thomas Healy will be real simple, and I think you guys can agree with these and the idea behind them. Um, scrutiny placed on specifications with regard to uh, fuel savings on the hybrid EX side, with regard to the fuel savings on the CNG side, specific to competition, uh, as well as the 120 uh, miles of, of, of additional savings that they get, um, saving, excuse me, the 120 uh, horsepower on the CNG side, right, with the competition, uh, and then the 25% diesel savings, I guess, let's just call it that, specifications. Um, where is the justification for said specifications on these units? Were they made up? Um, were they uh, derived at a test track? Were they put under realistic rigors of over-the-road transport in the Class 8 space? Um, where did the 1,000 miles of Hypertruck ERX range come from? Um, what is the horsepower of the Hypertruck ERX? Is it 550 horsepower? Is it 650 horsepower? Is it 1,345 horsepower? I, these mixed messages are just interesting enough to me. And somebody called it Walls, Where's Waldo. I thought it was the closest to truth that I saw. I got a little chuckle out of me anyway to release the information that way um, on the new commercial that Thomas Healy's doing that's, uh, you know, hopefully going to uh, drive some interest and awareness to the, uh, to the company. Um, and uh, who knows? We'll see. Uh, I, I don't know. But the specifications, um, is the equipment going to be able to perform as specified to deliver to these fleets the very uh, calculations that we're using to drive this TCO on the bottom line? Um, where is the validation? Where is the testing parameters? Where is the standards by which these uh, specifications are drawn from and measured against? Uh, and, and this would be something that I would be interested to hear uh, uh, an engineer's perspective, uh, Thomas Healy's on where they came up with this stuff. And I, I don't mean to sound like a Debbie Downer, guys. I, I really don't. But I tell you what, this has been something that I think about a lot in my continued due diligence of this company. I don't do due diligence on any other company I own right now. I, I don't need to. Um, highly on needs my attention. Um, and, and as I get hyper focused on this company, uh, am, I, am I suffering from over analysis? Am I an analyzing and being too critical? Um, these are all fair rhetorical questions of the company. Some may say, absolutely, Ryan, you just have to trust them at all costs. The specifications are there. Ryan, you got to just trust, trust, trust. Well, why is it not fair to ask what is going to drive the, the tabletop discussions with an Anheuser-Busch when you sit down with them and look to sell them on multiple years of orders when they've already put uh, the uh, Hypertruck ERX into the rigors of their own fleets and they were able to derive differing specifications than what Hylion has been so open with and adamant over the course of the uh, Hylion story. I mean, they have been steadfast. I have seen no differing figures on the thousand plus of range uh, on the Hypertruck ERX. Um, can that uh, specification be met on the onset and maintained through the life of the truck? Now there's a question for you. Uh, nothing ever performs as good as it does brand new. Uh, diesel actually maybe potentially performs better uh, on the onset once it's broken in. There's a sweet spot of efficiency and then efficiency starts to die down uh, when it starts to incur uh, maintenance costs over the long term. But Specifications are a big one. It'd be one that I would ask Thomas Healy to allude to how they came up and derived at, arrived at the numbers that they did for both the hybrid EX product as well as the Hypertruck ERX. Uh, second thing I would ask is uh, regarding durability. Um, we're talking about seven years on the light side, 10 years plus uh, in providing payback to the fleets. Uh, fleets are going to be looking at this as an investment. Hypertruck looks great. It really does. But let's be real. It has to perform. 
And if it does not perform, Hylion will fail. It really will. All of these public mar markets, all of the long leash, all of the funding that's been provided, all of the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars lost, all of the R&D flushed down the toilet. If this company cannot put a product in the hands of the fleets that number one, provide the specifications that I just talked about, additional payload, okay, uh, additional horsepower and torque, uh, and extended range. If they cannot provide those things, then what are we talking about here, guys? Okay, those will drive the TCO bottom line. Okay, but with regard to durability, durability is a different issue. And they're talking about winter validation, speaking to the durability piece. Okay, they brought FEV in, which are leading industry experts in the engineering field to identify the, 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 the small things that could fail wiring harnesses, things like that. Um, what can be expected with regard to salt on the roads in certain applications, snow, mud, how, how are those uh, going to mix with the wiring, the undercarriage treatment, all of the things that go with putting that truck into over the road service and getting some sort of predictable durability back out of the product, durability. There's 2,700 miles on the Hypertruck ERX right now. You don't think that it's fair for an investor like myself with just over 12,000 shares of the company. I, am, I have just as many shares as the top hedge funds that I disclosed to you guys. And I'm just a one guy. Um, this isn't, you know, Cornerstone Capital Solutions hedge fund. This is Ryan. Ryan, this is me. This is, that's it. And I've got more shares than they do. Okay. But is this not fair to ask with regard to the durability if you're looking to say, well, OK, the specifications are in line. We can expect those specifications to tail off in, in a certain degree, but we can expect to get on the bottom line seven years, eight years, nine years, and maybe 10 years plus as a bonus anywhere in that range. If we start to identify that the uh, durability falls off quicker than what we anticipated, let's say around year four, year five, year six, year seven, we have problems in Houston. I mean, in Austin, we have problems. And I, 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 I often come back to this and say, well, we're going to build new hyper trucks. It's not going to be the iteration that Jason sat in when he went down there to Austin to drive. It's going to be a, a better version, let's hope. OK, let's hope it's the best version that they possibly have uh, in light of the two years that they've had in public markets, relying on and resting upon um, the retail community and institutional investors alike uh, to get this product right. They don't have any other choice but to get this product right. But from a durability perspective, this product has to perform under the rigors of uh, over the over the road trucking uh, and and long haul trucking in the class A space, it has to perform. It's just that simple. So, what type of validation has been put into making the assessment on the Hypertruck ERX that it can meet those rigors and meet the demands of the class A space, and it can maintain its durability through that service life to make sure that that bottom line TCO can be met on the specifications that we're looking to sell industry on, okay? Durability. The next is of interest to me, and Rick Schnellman uh, shared a great YouTube video on Volvo Penta, the OEM, and said, here's why you don't invest in Nikola. Uh, it's very, very, uh, it's amazing, the OEM. I've been to Redford, Detroit Diesel, the OEM. Um, he's right. It's incredible. I, I, I still remember to this day some of the details that I saw at Detroit Diesel, um, the inner workings of the line and uh, the assistance of every little machine tool that the workers had, uh, the precision in delivering the products to the line so as not to hold up the line. It, 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 is, it is an engineering marvel in and of itself. And Thomas Healy knows this, he does. That's so why I speak so highly about the relationship that they have with Peterbilt. I can expect that Peterbilt has something similar to turn out 40,000 trucks per year. But the video itself was on 
was on Volvo Penta. And if you pay particular attention to uh, the video, it was, it was a good long video on OEMs. They came to the part about safety and it caught my attention. And as uh, scrutinizing a mind as I have, and uh, maybe, maybe to some people's dislike, and, and that's totally fine. You're welcome to have your opinion of me and uh, believe what you will about me and believe that I, my story is misconstrued or um, I don't have all the facts. But my question to Mr. Healy would be very simple. Um, what type of, of safety acknowledgement uh, would be placed on a Hypertruck ERX without the compliments of a uh, main diesel engine as opposed to a diesel generator uh, ahead of the cockpit. What type of uh, frame reinforcements uh, have been thought about? Uh, what type of crash tests, if any, have the Hypertruck ERX been put through? Um, Volvo Penta and NVIDIA on the OEM perspective talked about some um, extraordinary collisions, uh, collisions from the front quarter where it only hit half of the truck on the driver's side, right? Um, I don't know how often they, they go with a tandem, uh, like a co-pilot, uh, and there's two people in the truck. Again, I'm not a trucker. I don't want to misspeak. Um, but if, if there was an impact on the side of the driver, how, how could that isolated impact potentially impact the driver? And they, they showed the impact test that they do at the facility. Uh, specifically, is this going to be part of the certification uh, through the EPA, uh, through NIPSA, uh, through 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 the CARB, which is emissions? But you know, ha have those uh, concessions and acknowledgments happened at Ilion? You know, it's it's an easy thing to say safety is our paramount priority, but when you see Volvo Penta walking the walk and running their trucks through the rigor of you know, driver safety <laughs> after building them off the line and making sure that every single product that comes off of that OEM line is perfect to specifications, we can, we can actually presume or forecast that not a lot of has been done on this front. So it's a concern on my part to say, look, if the Hypertruck ERX is involved in a head-on collision, uh, going 65 miles an hour. Is this a realistic scenario? I don't know what the test and rigor that, that these trucks need to be put through to ensure driver safety have been put through. But would it change the game by not having that main diesel e engine uh, in, in, in ahead of the cockpit uh, as opposed to having that uh, generator uh, on board there? Uh, furthermore, with regard to the safety protocol, what additional safety features are necessary when you've got a compressed natural gas tank uh, on the back of it? What can be expected from that tank? How will that tank actually perform uh, if it's engulfed in flame? Will there, there be uh, a, a potential for blevy? Will, we're, will it uh, ignite? Uh, is there protections that are uh, built into it for the driver safety to actually get out of the cab uh, before any of those things can transpire? You know, what happens if you have a catastrophic loss of the tank? All kinds of different scenarios to ask yourself. And it all comes down for me, again, one word. I've never heard anybody talk to Thomas Healy about the perspective of safety, driver safety, with regard to this wonderful idea, yes, wonderful idea. But when we start to look at the bridge between a wonderful idea and yes, what they have now in all fairness to be a prototype and getting to a certified final product that industry is salivating at the mouth to get a hold of, I think we're a ways away from that. And I hope I'm overthinking that. I do. I, I think that concessions have absolutely been made if you're going to put a, a, a truck on the road, those concessions have to be made with regard to driver safety and 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 and, uh, and the like. And, and I, I I would love to hear it from the head guy uh, what they've done internally or externally through data, uh, through through statistical uh, and analytical review uh, of the safety protocol that exists with the Hypertruck ERX. Sometimes I come back to this sleight of hand with Highland Holdings. 
and I can't help but to feel slighted a little bit. And, and here's why. I thought they were a little more along the lines with a final product. Um, come to find out, um, I own a lot of the company, and then I come to find out we're two years away. Now, part of that is not highly on fault with the supply chain issues. I get that. But part of the sleight of hand that I'm referring to specifically is with regard to this idea that renewable natural gas could drive a net uh, negative carbon emissions profile. And here's why I believe that this is somewhat of a sleight of hand. And I'd love to hear Thomas Healy's explanation as to what is gonna be realistically feasible in the fuel of choice that's put into the Hypertruck ERX. Is renewable natural gas readily available to go into the Hypertruck ERX as we speak? The answer is no, no it's not. And I think the sleight of hand existed with compressed natural gas being readily available through the ANG network of 729 stations across North America to provide fuel right now uh, to the Hypertruck. Now the Hypertruck drives a net uh, carbon negative profile if it has the ability to draw from uh, biomass, uh, from uh, landfills, uh, from dairy farms, et cetera, those types of things. And we're able to take that renewable natural gas, i.e. methane, put it into the tank and run the uh, onboard generator onboard the Hypertruck ERX to say, look, we, we're using this methane to drive the truck where it would have been off-gassed to the atmosphere, therefore driving down that net uh, negative profile uh, in carbon emissions. Verdict is still out for me a little bit here, guys. Um, how available is renewable natural gas going to be over the next five years? Are these fleets realistically going to be uh, driving the hyper truck ERX with the expectation that they're going to be able to fuel those rigs with renewable natural gas? Or are they going to have to put compressed natural gas into uh, these rigs uh, because of the lack of availability of, of renewable natural gas? Um, what is the uh, permitting? Uh, and uh, uptick of renewable natural gas availability. Now this Thomas has talked about last year at the ACT Expo. He spoke about these things, um, but how realistic are these? Um, and these, again, come back to the whole sleight of hand idea that, that somehow the Hypertruck ERX was gonna light the industry on fire uh, and fleets were gonna be made available a product that they were gonna be able to burn renewable natural gas and take that net negative difference and offset some of the positive uh, carbon emission score that their companies, large companies are subject to uh, on their carbon uh, suitability profile uh, and, and look to offset some of those figures. How much offsetting is going to be, uh, to be able to be done with compressed natural gas? Um, how much cleaner of a fuel is it than renewable natural gas or how less uh, 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 cleaner? of a fuel, comparatively speaking, to renewables is there? Uh, am I looking into that too far? Uh, but, but for me, you know, it, it's been a, a, a shift away from this discussion about renewable natural gas and more of a discussion about the focus on CNG, which is plastered right on the prototype of the Hypertruck ERX. Is that the dominant fuel here? And RNG is just a pipe dream, no pun intended, where there is no pipe infrastructure or there is but very little availability to even rest upon as a viable fuel for fleets to rely on consistency uh, consistently uh, as a fuel of choice within their industry. Uh, th this is something that um, has bothered me a little bit in, in the acute in the short term because you know on the onset I, I, I presumed that the RNG was going to be made a lot more available through the existing infrastructure uh, through the CNG plants. Now, ANG may have something up their sleeve as far as how they're going to put this to the trucks. They do have a hyper truck order in uh, a reservation, excuse me, of 250 as of, as of today. Uh, whether or not they're looking to transition some of their orders over, I, I've never seen the Innovation Council step forward and provide any uh, solidified binding orders. I don't see any hurry to do that. Uh, are we subject to this uh, no man's land that we're in and, and have been in for the last couple months, I would say, ever since the Q4 call 
Yeah, I, I think it, we probably are. Uh, do, do we have great things on the horizon? Probably. Yeah, we probably do. But they're going to have to surgically and strategically offer this information to the marketplace because I don't know how much longer the stock can hold in here. And there's a lot of people talking, look, if it goes below $3, people are going to be starting to buy up 10,000 shares. That's a bunch of that's a bunch of crap. You're not going to do that. You're not going to do it. It's a lot easier said than done. There's a lot of people right now that are talking high on their high horse about how much stock they're going to load the boat on right now. When in fact, over the next coming years, I, I paint a picture not of roses. Highland is going to have to work incredibly hard, harder than they've ever worked before to, to, to make sure that these uh, visions aren't for naught, that these good ideas aren't, aren't for naught, that a paradigm shift in the industry and, and looking to move to, to, to something other than uh, renewables or even CNG uh, as, as something that's uh, maybe even more viable. Talk about that in just a sec here. But what asked Thomas Healy about the insist insistence upon solidifying the board uh, so often and so early in the game? Okay. And I, I hope there's highly on shareholders out there that can provide me some insight and say, Hey, Ryan, you're a little off here. Uh, you, you're a little hard over on this one, okay? Perhaps this isn't meant to be hard over or soft over, okay? It's meant to be an observation. When I look at the team and the hiring uh, and the solidification of the upper management, the sales team, um, the CFO, I love. I think she's fabulous. I think Sherry Baker was a home run. Um, some of the other executives that they've picked up, um, excuse me, in the upper management, but the executive team, Hylion gets an A plus in this category, okay? I'm also quick to say, what was the insistence upon building out that board, the upper management? Not so much the upper management, but the board of directors so fast. Can anybody answer me that question? Can anybody provide me one iota of dividends paid back to highly on holdings from being so quick to solidify that board. Now, remember in the face of a market that has provided zero, zero financial benefit to the very institutions and retail investors that provided the funding uh, through the SPAC process and the issuance of warrants up front. In the face of that, we rushed to solidify a board of directors that, again, I provide and, and I, I, I contend is an A-plus home run for Hylian. What is it that has been garnered up to this point from that board of directors? Can anybody help me? Ain't there's connections to the government. No doubt about it. Mr. Knight, right? Elaine Chow, connections to the government. What has transpired from it? This is my assessment, zero, okay? So my question to Thomas Healy was with the insistence of solidifying the board so early in the game, what is it that you expect for your vision for the future to come from solidifying that board and bringing them on to the highly on experience so early in the game to expect that those connections would be there, that those uh, connections and, and networking and sheer access to information within the industry would pay dividends for Hylian Holdings. Is that what we're to expect from this board of directors? Because it's interesting, you know, from my perspective, from a small chair, a small corner of social media, it seems like we solidified this board of directors and I give kudos to the uh, initiative to do so. And there has been all of zero, zero payback on that front. Okay, zero. I hope I'm wrong going forward. I believe that I will be. And I hope I will be for the good of myself and other shareholders in this company that are patiently waiting and will continue to wait inevitably. This leash that I refer to with Hylion, um, we've allowed the dog to pull the leash away from us. Our neon dog is running hundreds and hundreds of miles away from us at this point. And I just can only hope that uh, they're doing great things. Uh, with this long leash that we've provided them, okay? Um, another thing that um, is of interest to me in discussing the green initiative and the 
uh, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and uh, targeted focusing on those uh, industries that uh, have been known to be problem children with regard to their uh, social governance and their environmental governance and you know their stewardship needing to improve over time. <clears throat> the the knock on on full electric up to this point there's a lot. I don't invest in full electric. I'm not a fan of Tesla. I'm not a fan of the pressure that that's going to put on the regulated utilities and the grid. Um, I'm not a fan of full electric, especially in the class eight space. I think full electric will have its place, yada, yada. And even that is hard for me to say, because I just don't see the technology as, 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 as tried and true as it needs to be right now to get as much favor as it gets right now. And that favor certainly bleeds over into the class eight space. I mean, the class eight uh, Tesla semi program has been nothing but a disaster. It's been an absolute nightmare. It's been a complete and utter failure. Uh, the stock goes up every day. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you can be the best investor out there and still not make money. Uh, it's just that simple. You, know, you can invest in a company that you've done due diligence on and still lose money. What do you do? Do you pull shocks and just put all your money into Tesla and hope that the valuation that is unjustifiable at these levels uh, will somehow make it justifiable at some point in the future. I, I think the very product is what's flawed with Tesla. Whereas with Hylian, I think the product is its absolute strong suit. I call it a one trick pony. Uh, I, I believe that that one product that they have can revolutionize an industry that is the number one polluter on this earth. It's one of those cornerstones of conviction that I've always had in Hylian in looking at this opportunity as having the viable solution that can be put into place to actually put into uh, the rigors of class eight, the specifications that I demand a little bit more validation on, uh, the durability that I believe that they can achieve can really turn back some bottom line benefits for the industry that they look to serve. But what if nuclear energy is brought into the play? We have brought more nuclear reactors online within the last few years than we have in the previous 30 years, okay? We are shifting big time to nuclear energy, okay? The uh, bill that was signed in play November of last year provided a carve out uh, in the tune of a billion and a half dollars to reinstate, uh, to, to make sure that the uh, existing nuclear facilities that we have uh, can, can continue to maintain uh, the load on the energy grid and provide that nuclear energy. What about the availability of that said uranium to provide that uh, nuclear energy on all fronts? What if the argument dies away that the coal-fired plants that's providing the very electricity that goes to the charging grid is now substituted or augmented with nuclear power? Does the appeal of RNG fizzle? Does the lack of availability of fossil fuels call, causing this feeding frenzy right now of oil with, with just three year, short years ago, it nobody wanted to even take a bath in it, let alone own it as a commodity. And now all of a sudden it's trading right along with any other commodity. It's the hottest commodity out there going, oil, right? What if nuclear actually moves into the picture and we actually start to step in that direction as opposed to, you know, looking at an opportunity with a, a compressed natural gas, which unfortunately falls under the umbrella of a fossil fuel. All right. So I think some of the political implications here, there are pressures that are high, holding highly on down. And, and I just can't put my thumb on it right now. I'm just about as confused as you guys. But I wanted to touch on these few things that um, I feel are uh, of interest to me at this point with owning this stock. I want to continue to foot stomp the message and keep the awareness going on the company. Um, there's been some very, very kind comments come through. And for you guys that appreciate my comments and continued uh, steadfast message every week on Hylion, 
really appreciate you guys and the support that you guys give me. I, I like it. I really enjoy this. I enjoy being uh, invested in the company. Uh, but uh, I tell you what, over the last two years, it's been nothing more than a, a futile mental game and a, and a mental anguish because you can, you can almost take a, a, a dartboard and throw a, a dart at it and own whatever stock hits that dartboard. And that stock is going to go up and it's going to go down and it's going to go up and it's going to go down and it's going to go up and it's going to go down. The, the difference between that scenario that I just told you out of sheer luck, just picking a company out of the thin, clear, thin blue sky, right? And highly on holdings is that highly on holdings, uh, a, as far as its uh, emergence into public markets, have forgotten that it has never gone up. Never. It has done nothing but go down. It has gone down. It is, it's gone down. It, it's, it's gone down. Uh, it, and it's gone down. And it's gone down. And no stock does that. <laughs> no stock does that. I cannot put my thumb on it. Uh, and I will not chalk it up to market manipulation. Could it be? Yes. I have some premonition that that is partially the problem. I think partially that Hylion had a bullseye on its back uh, ever since it came to public markets. And I think a lot of that bullseye being on their back has been by nature of the fact that they took a chance on coming to pu public markets uh, to close the gap in progress uh, when they should have been farther along the path to progress or the path to a, a, a real and viable product to earn a bottom line profit, uh, as opposed to just inevitably, hopefully, gaining some sort of, of revenue. Um, the revenue garnered last year was um, uh, immaterial, uh, to use Sherry Baker's words with the company. But there seem to be a lot of people that are excited about this company. I provided you guys some insights at the top of the show to show that the net inflows into this company might suggest that I'm not the only one. Um, the naysayers in my inner circle um, that uh, are whispering in my ear uh, are in fact behind me. And for you guys that dare to lead, it's tough. It's tough. It's tough to stake your claim. It's tough to remain convicted. It's easy to second guess. It's easy to bow out stage right it's easy to throw in the towel. All of those things are easy to do. And if the stock market were that easy to beat, if the stock market was that easy to predict, if the stock market was that easy to look at and say, all I have to do is work really, really hard at it, everybody would do this. But the stock market has a great way of weeding people out. It has a, a great way of rewarding the tough. And it has a great way over time, not in the acute, but over the long term of getting it right, where in the face of over the short term, it all too often gets it wrong. Guys, thank you so much. I'd invite you to leave your comments at the bottom of this video, a little different tone and tenor in this video. I do this every week. We're going to talk highly on holdings every week until rapture. We've got 24 months we're going to identify the catalysts as they come up. If any of the topics uh, jogged your thought processes, strike up a dialogue with me. If you think that I'm completely off, off base or if you want to join the inner circle behind me who think that um, I'm crazy and I'll never make a dime with this, uh, this stock, no problem. Join the inner circle. It's no problem. Um, I lead from the front. Um, and although I do hear the whispers behind me, I'd like to re-emphasize to you that they are in fact behind me. Hit the like button, hit the notification bell if you like videos like this, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. The totality of this message and good luck in your investment future. <laughs>